Watch this. Now what if I told you those good shots were the bow's fault? Not mine. This is the best bow that you can't buy, and today I'm gonna expose why it is so good. And you can't buy it because it's not for sale. Yet. Introducing the ultimate bow for precision and power, your ticket to consistently hitting the bullseye with ease. We've revolutionized archery with a bow that seamlessly combines speed and smoothness into an unbeatable package, with a maximum speed of 223 feet per second even with a 43 pound draw weight. Your arrows will soar with unparalleled accuracy, flying flat and true to your target every single time. But don't just take our word for it, experience the unparalleled smoothness for yourself. Trust us, you won't be disappointed. Upgrade your game and elevate your archery experience with our cutting edge bow today, the Mountain Bow. So that's exactly what you get when you ask AI to write a commercial about the contents of this video, but it was a little soulless, so I'm going to introduce you to the Mountain Bow. Oh, and by the way, that's a fake commercial because you can't actually buy this bow. More on that at the end of the video. A quick warning to everybody, this video goes deep for the archery nerds. We will have a lot of fun. I hope you learned something, but buckle up your seatbelt to think hard. I may or may not be right on some of the contents of this video, but I'll do my best to tell the truth as close to as I know it today. Amen. I built this bow. This is the seventh iteration of this bow design, and I really like how this one turned out. I think this bow has cracked the code of combining speed and smoothness, although there is one big problem to this bow. Today we're covering seven things about this bow, about bow design, and what makes a bow good. I'm gonna basically be reviewing my own bow today. In order to do this, it'd be good to keep a couple things in mind. First, this bow design other bowyers and other people have made before. I'm not the first. This one is unique in the sense that I made it. It's one of a kind. The exact pairing and limb shape is from different testing I did to fall on this result. But there's other bows similar to this out there. Also keep in mind that every person has a specific type of bow they like, and that preference can change over time. What kind of bow you like is subjective. It's a personal preference. Now today I'm going to share my perspective of why I like this, and I'm not saying that you should like it or even that you will like this type of bow. Also know that draw length and draw weight of an individual will change how the bow performs for the person. So if I were to give this bow to somebody who's 5'6 and draws a really short draw length compared to a 6'3 person like me drawing a long draw length, it could perform differently for them. And they might want a different design. So for me, 6'3 with a 6'7 wingspan, this design tends to lead as a 29 or 30 inch draw length to a very enjoyable shooting experience. I think you're gonna find these seven things fascinating. Let's go. Number one, what is the mountain bow and why is it so special to me? The mountain bow is a bow I've designed that hits the sweet spot for me. It's really smooth to shoot and it's naturally accurate. I used to think smoothness and speed were incompatible factors when building a bow, but I found that by increasing the smoothness, you can increase the speed in a couple areas. So I believe what partially makes a bow smooth also makes it fast. But there's also other things you could change that make a bow smoother and make it less fast. Here's an example. This bow right here is 50 pounds. This bow right here is 37 pounds. The 37 pound bow is gonna be a little bit smoother than the 50 pound bow, but it's also gonna be a little bit slower. So by changing the factor of draw weight, in most cases is going to make it a little smoother, but also a little slower, or a little more vibration, but a little faster. I assume by that designing a faster bow, it would drop the smoothness like it was the draw weight, but that's not the case. Mountain bow two was this one, and I intended to make the limbs come off straighter, storing more energy in the bow, opposed to making the limbs come off facing downwards towards the archer. But what I found is that with the flat limb shape, the bow became so unstable that it was actually slower. Whereas with it coming off the riser at an angle, it was faster. So this bow at the same draw weight is faster and smoother with the same limbs than this bow at the same draw weight. This opens up a pretty cool door to bow making because if you can increase two things you want at the same time with no downsides, why wouldn't you? And that is why this bow is so special to me. But to understand this further, let's talk about what you can change about a riser. 
There are four major things that you can change about a riser. The first one is that you can change the riser position in relation to the limbs. You can have a riser that's further forward or a riser that's further back. This alone makes a major difference of how the limbs are gonna come off the riser and how smooth the bow is to shoot. Secondly, you can change the angle at which the limbs contact the riser. You can have them facing the archer, you could have them facing away from the archer, you could have them neutral and flat. You can also do this for a one-piece bow as well. It's not just takedown bows, it's just dependent on the shape of the riser and then at what angle you're gonna have the limbs come off of the riser. You can change the riser length. This right here is a 12 inch riser, which is typically considered a pretty short riser. It's often believed that the shorter risers tend to have a little bit more vibration, maybe a little less stability, a little less weight to absorb some of the vibration. Shorter sight picture for some people tends to be a little bit harder to aim depending on your aiming method. So you can change the length of your riser. And then you can also change the riser material. If you use a really light material, or you could use metal, you could use a heavy material, you could use light wood or heavy wood. I've even heard of some bowyers who will drill holes in the riser and melt lead in there and then plug the hole just to add weight to the riser so that it absorbs some more vibration. Those are the four big things you can do to change the riser, but you can do quite a bit to change the limbs as well. Here are five things you can do to change the limbs. You can change the shape of the limbs. You could have a recurve limb, you could have a reflex limb, you could have a flat limb. You could do all sorts of different shapes with a limb. Secondly, you can change the limb length. So you could have the same shape like these two limbs. This one's strong, this one's not strong, so they'll look different right now. But one of these limbs is a fair amount shorter than the other, about four inches. The limb length will change how smooth the release feels. It'll change how fast the bow goes. It'll change how much stacking there is or lack of. It'll change everything. You can also change the working length of the limbs with wedges. All bows have a fade out coming off of a riser. The fade out is a wedge in this case. On this one piece of bow, it's not a wedge, but it's a gradual piece of wood that's tapered down and feathered down to nothing. By the length of the wedge or the feather, you can change the length of the working limb. The working limb is different than the limb length. I could have a 26 inch limb, but only have 16 inches of it working because I could have a 10 inch wedge. And on top of that, you can place wedges throughout the bow. So on this one, I have a eight inch wedge right here, but I also have a six inch wedge right here. So the working limb is only the 16 inches between those two wedges. That changes everything as well. Everything seems to change everything. But what I'm doing there is hopefully getting the speed of a longer lever, so to speak, but not all of the limb is bending, storing the energy in a smaller section, slinging that arrow downrange faster than I'll get out. Next, you can change the width of the limbs. You can change the taper and how wide they are. Why would you do this? Wouldn't you just want the thinnest limbs possible? Well, some limbs are gonna absorb more vibration than others, and then based on the type of recurve or reflex you have, if it's a really tight recurve, you need more stability, which means you need a wider limb, than if you have a flat, straight, long bow, you can get away with thinner limbs. The fifth thing on the limbs that you can change is the type of material. We're dealing with compression and tension. We're also dealing with a, a lot of weight, what weighs the most, and also what's the most springy for the core inside material. How heavy is it? How light is it? Lighter's not always better because something like carbon fiber can be super light, but also can provide more hand vibration and make it less enjoyable to shoot. So this is a dance between all of these factors. And I just gave nine big bucket factors, four on the riser, five on the limb, but I can come up with about 300 different limb shapes. And if I can come up with 300 limb shapes, I can probably come up with similar types of variation for the riser. And then when you multiply all nine of those by 300 or whatever it is, like you're getting so many different variations and factors that you can end up with with a bow. So you take a bow like these two that look pretty similar. One's a one piece, one's a takedown. This is actually my favorite one piece bow and this is my favorite takedown bow. And there's a reason they're both my favorite is because they both perform in a similar manner because of following similar principles. But they're definitely not the same. And this is the exciting thing about bow making for me is that it's truly individualistic and truly my own. No one's gonna make a bow that's exactly like this. Well, maybe they will. Here's my thought process of how I come to these conclusions with these bows. I find myself as an experimenter when I build bows and uh, I'm trying to find out new things, new designs, trying to understand why something's happening. You could come up with a bow design and uh, it'd be fantastic, but you don't know why it's shooting so good. And it all comes down to two little words. Why not? I ask myself these questions. Why not? Why not make the limbs longer? 
and then I have to come up with an answer for that. Why not change the angle three degrees facing towards the target more coming off the riser handle? Why not make the limbs thinner? Why not make the tip overlay wedge longer? Why not make an eight inch riser instead of a 12 inch riser? Why not make an 18 inch riser instead of an eight inch riser? So I go through these questions and then I actually answer that question. And if I don't have an answer for that question, I build a bow to help me understand and answer that question. That's why this is the seventh version I've done. The other six versions were answering questions I didn't think I had answers to. And with this bow, I have very few questions left. I think I will test a couple different variations of limb links and maybe wedge links, but I don't really have a need to because of how much I'm enjoying how it's shooting right now. But I would like to, to be able to answer that question, why not? Why not make it one inch shorter? It, it, might just, it might just shoot about the exact same, but just be a little faster. And maybe that's great. Why not make it four inches shorter? Well, I can't get it to my draw length then. So with, with this limb shape and riser shape. And so there's, there's a line, but where is it? And how do I get there without testing it? So my rule is why not do this? And if I don't have a good answer to it, then you test it and find out why. Is that something like the scientific method? I don't know. I dropped out. Number five is my big theory of why this has hit a sweet spot. Why is it so enjoyable to shoot? Why is it that every person I've had shoot this is more accurate immediately with it than other bows that they shoot? Why is that? Some of these things seem counterintuitive and I can't prove them yet, but they seem to be true to me. The first thing is a forward handle in relation to the limbs tends to be faster and smoother. Not too far forward, not too far back. What's the sweet spot? Well, here's the big secret. Why am I giving this away? The sweet spot tends to be if you draw a vertical line from the throat of the handle, that that throat of the handle is pretty much right where the limbs come off the riser. That seems to be the most balanced, the most stable position out of any design I've tested. I was trying to make it a little smoother and incidentally, it got faster as well with the exact same limbs compared to other designs. And that shocked me a little bit and I can't explain it fully, but here's why I think it is faster. I think it's faster because the limbs are nearly straight at brace height. Meaning if you draw a line like this, they're nearly straight. If a limb has too much recurve at brace height, I think something happens where you lose stability. A while ago on the Shatterproof Archery YouTube channel, I tested an idea. And my idea was that the greater the brace height, the slower the bow would be, and the lower the brace height, the faster the bow would be. I tested different bows and I found this to be true. What I also found to be true is that the greater the brace height, the poundage, the draw weight of the bow actually went up a little bit. Fascinating. So you can have a heavier poundage bow with a nine and a half inch brace height and the bow be slower. It's like you just ruined everything. There is a sweet spot because you'll slap your wrist. But with that in mind, it appears to me that with the limb finishing- What he's also trying to say is that the lesser the distance is between the string and the bow, the more efficient the bow will be because there's less stored energy that goes unused. That's it. And then let me hold this one. More stored energy that goes unused because the string's not coming past here. If it's ending with a lot of energy still in the limbs, it's slower in my experience. The other thing is that it's a little bit faster because the limbs are traveling a shorter distance. So when you draw a bow, the limb tip moves. On a shorter bow, the limb tip moves further. And if you have a shorter bow and the limb tip's moving 10 inches and a longer bow and the limb tip's moving six inches, but they're both 40 pounds, it's gonna take less time, as long as you don't add too much mass, for the limb tip to move the shorter distance. And that increases the speed. As long as you don't increase too much mass by increasing the length, you actually get a faster bow. And I think that's what this one did as well. I've posted a few videos discussing bow speeds and I'm actually still learning more about it, uh, but those videos can give you a good baseline of information if you're interested. That's why I think it's a little faster than a lot of the other designs, actually a lot of other bows on the market. Uh, but, but, but why is it smoother than other bows? Well, it's smoother because it is. 
No, it has a forward facing handle and that makes it smoother. And also if you don't have a recurve, it tends to be smoother on a lot of designs because of the impact of the string hitting the limbs tends to cause a little bit more vibration. So I've got it so close to being a recurve, but it's not that I think it has that speed advantage without the downside of it vibrating more. I have done these same limbs on a handle further back and it had a little bit more vibration, that's for sure. Uh, for whatever reason, something's absorbing that vibration or maybe less vibrations being caused, I'm not sure which. Here's another one that you probably haven't thought of. Even if you've everything up to this point, you're like, yes, Kramer, I know, I know, I know. Maybe just there's a small chance you haven't thought about this for accuracy. I think there's two things that go into accuracy more than anything else. When someone picks up a bow and they shoot it for the first time, there's two things that make them determine whether it's accurate or not. Both of these two things are on feel and are subconscious. But as a bow maker, I think I know how to put these into a bow. The first one is how easy it is to draw the bow back for the archer. There's a term called a smooth draw. This generally refers to how effortless it is to pull the bow back. And there's a poundage curve, so each inch the bow goes further back, it increases a certain amount of draw weight. The bows that are easier to be more accurate do not increase dramatically near the end of drawing the bow back. Let me rephrase it. The bow that'll feel the most accurate is the bow that can be drawn three inches past your max draw length. If I draw 29 inches, I like the bow to be able to handle a 32 inch draw. That makes it feel more accurate. Number two, now this is the big one. This is the one that if you make bows and sell them, if you're a bow company, which a few do watch this channel, I'd be curious your thoughts on this. This is a one half inch difference in the bow that makes the bow feel a lot more accurate. That one half inch difference is the distance from the throat of the handle to the top of the arrow shelf. With this bow right here, I have a one and three quarter inch distance between the throat of the handle and the top of the arrow shelf. What does this do for me versus a traditional one and a quarter? Some are down to three quarters of an inch, but by extending that distance to one and three quarters of an inch, what does that do? What I think it's done is raise the arrow up. Why, why is that important? It's important because it has changed the sight picture to such a sight picture that my gap distance is closer to the most common distance I shoot. Lots of people say, oh, the average gap is a 40 yards is a 40 yard gap, which is true. But what if your, your gap was 20 yards? Your point on gap was 20 yards. So meaning when you put the arrow on the target at 20 yards, you hit there. And that's probably one of the most common yards we shoot. Wouldn't you want the most common yard you shoot to be the yardage at which your gap is? So by raising the arrow shelf up, what I've noticed is your gap becomes shorter. And this is the same for people who would claim to shoot split vision or people who shoot instinctive, the sight picture changes and the tip of the arrow is getting closer to the bullseye. Whether your arrow is in your conscious mind or not, when you're shooting, it feels more natural to have a smaller gap. And that mental feeling, that, that sight picture, it makes it easier to be more accurate. Super smooth draw, where it looks like the arrow should go, the arrow goes making the bow feel or be more accurate for most archers. If you've ever shot a bow that has a really large gap or something, you feel like you have to aim three feet below the target to hit the target or something like that. I've had that with many bows. That's not an accurate feeling bow. That's at least the reason why I think this bow is more accurate and more intuitive to shoot. It sounds all dandy and good, but that's not everything about changing the arrow shelves. There are a bad side when you do something potentially good. The center of the bow is the throat of the handle. That makes it nice and balanced. The other thing that it also does is reduce vibration when shooting. With that, the arrow shelf is above center. So we're, we're discussing how far above the center of the bow do we want the arrow shelf. Well, what can be the downsides to that? The downside is the further your fingers get from the center of the bow string, the greater chance of odd shots that happen. So if you're someone who string walks and you're using, let's say a short bow 
you're gonna have some trouble string walking when you get to a certain part down the string. Now, for me, I shoot three under and I like to slightly string walk. What I mean by slightly string walk is maybe half an inch or so. And with that, having a higher arrow shelf is absolutely perfect. As a matter of fact, I shoot most of my shots as I've been testing out this bow with about an eighth inch gap below my arrow. And that gives me a really nice 20 yard point on. But if you're somebody who shoots split finger and it's this high up, it doesn't benefit you as much as it does someone who's shooting three under. Now it's not so high up that split finger creates bad arrow flight. The big benefit is three under, and then if I string walk a quarter inch, eighth inch, up to a half inch, that arrow is getting raised up real close to my eye, which gives me a really good sight picture for the way I have been liking to shoot. It's a little bit of a tug and war with these things because you change something and it makes it good for one scenario and bad for another scenario. So what's bad about this design? Well, the manufacturing is a little bit difficult. Because of the way the, the riser is, I broke a riser uh, and it split my, the, the wood I used. What you realize here is you're basically putting a breaker bar on the limb and then ripping it down. And if you draw a straight line from where the limb attaches to where the throat of the handle is on my riser, you end up with two and a half to three inches. So you got a 12 inch riser, but you have a two and a half inch section right here that's taking all of the force of that bottom limb. And that can cause a very large weak point and you'll need really strong material to build it. The second thing that's kind of annoying when you build it is because the forward of the handle comes so far down and the back is so far up, you need a really thick block of wood. Most risers I build, uh, you could get two risers out of the block of wood you need for this big riser. Now, if you're gluing up smaller pieces, you can kind of glue them up in an odd shape to maybe accommodate less waste of material, but that makes it a little bit more difficult, a little bit more annoying using twice the material for one bow. Number seven, what am I gonna do with this information moving forward? A lot of people have asked me uh, if I'll sell these or if they can buy one. And the answer to that is I would love to sell these. I'd love to get these out to everybody. It's not probably about if it's more a question of, of when I'll be able to um, get the manufacturing dialed in. Because of the way I run Shatterproof Archery, I'm more concerned about getting it right than getting it out quick. And I do that with all products. So sometimes it takes me a little bit of time to get everything dialed in. But once it's dialed in, it's dialed in. And that's a, that's a great feeling. For how much enjoyment I've got out of this bow already, I would love to pass that on to other people if I can. So as of March, 2024, we do not sell this bow. We do actually, however, sell the bones, which is this one piece bow I was giving as an example earlier, has a lot of the same principles and is a very enjoyable bow. This is my main bow I shoot. Um, I've been switching over to this one right now, but this has been the main bow I've shot for the last two years. For a few of you who want this bow and want to get it when we come out with it, make sure you're signed up to the Shatterproof Archery newsletter. We send out one or two emails a month. It's generally about a video like this. There's no spam. Uh, we only discount the website once a year on Black Friday, so we're not going to just like bombard you with anything. We're just gonna try to give you good information. When you need to buy a product, you know when to buy it. I don't have to tell you when to buy something. But what we utilize that list for is to let you know when these are for sale or we've been running out of stock a lot on the bones right here. So whenever we get back in stock, we're able to let people know. So if you wanna make sure you get information about the new products and stuff, that email list is definitely the place. It's in the description if you're interested. Definitely place to sign up for. Um, I hate doing emails. I'm dyslexic. It's no fun. So I put that principle into the emails we send out as far as um, not annoying people, I guess. At least we try not to. And with that, go shoot your bow and enjoy the soul building experience of archery. Stay shatterproof, my friends. If you need anything, let us know. We're here for you, helping more people enjoy more archery. My name's Kramer Ammons. It's been an honor that you watched this long. It really has been. Thank you so much. You've changed my life. I appreciate it. I'll see you guys on the next video.